Welcome to a Legendarium special about the Fallvilles, the legendary outlaws of medieval England. In this episode, we will learn about how four highborn brothers robbed from the rich and gave to themselves. Medieval outlaws have often been made out to be heroes fighting for the common man against unjust lords protected by the law. In truth, the outlaws tended to be the lords themselves, not peasants. Why is this the case? It goes back to medieval inheritance laws where only the eldest son of a landowner would inherit the property. Any other sons would usually join the retinue of a lord in search of his fortune or he would join the church. Some of those spare sons, however, fully trained up in the art of war, turned to crime. In the case of the Falville family, when old John de Falville died, his eldest son, also named John de Falville, inherited the property and lived the life of a landed lord. However, the other Falville brothers, named Eustace, Robert, Walter, and Richard, formed a band of violent mercenaries. Curiously, Richard became a priest, but that did not stop him from pursuing a life of crime. They chose a good time to begin their career as outlaws when Queen Isabella rebelled against her husband, King Edward II. In 1326, Roger de Beller, the Baron of the Exchequer, made threats against the Falville family. Eustace led a band of 50 men and captured him on the road before murdering him. Of course, the local court issued a warrant for their arrest. And this is important because anyone who failed to show themselves at court when summoned would become an outlaw, something the Falvilles did with enthusiasm. They fled England to join Queen Isabella's army on the continent, then gathering to depose the king. When she successfully seized England, she granted the Falvilles pardons for their good service. In an age before standing armies, lords and kings and queens could raise armies fast by offering outlaws pardons in exchange for their service, along with a license to loot in the meantime. The Falvilles did just that, stealing 200 pounds worth of goods from the people of Leicester while quartered with the royal army. Upon Queen Isabella's victory, the Falvilles went back to work as criminals, robbing not to feed the poor, but to line their own pockets. They targeted the lands of the de Beller family, who resisted them in the past, and they wreaked havoc across the shires. From 1327 to 1330, Eustace was accused of, or mentioned in connection with, three robberies, four murders, and a rape, almost certainly an underestimate. Why did they get away with this? Because the authorities relied on local cooperation to find criminals, and the people tended to fear the Fallvilles more than the good sheriff. And quite a few of the locals worked for the Fallvilles as informants and spies. The authorities did try to fight back, unsuccessfully. After stealing animals from the estate of Henry de Beaumont, a judge named Sir Richard Willoughby issued yet another warrant for the arrest of the Fallvilles. However, rather than give themselves up, they kidnapped the judge. Of course, a few hardened criminals by themselves couldn't pull this off, so they recruited other highborn gangs like the Cotterells, Bradburns, and the well-named Savage Company. They even recruited pillars of society like the Constable of Rockingham Castle, who previously quarreled with Willoughby and saw this as his chance for revenge. After abducting Willoughby, they moved him from one castle to another until they ransomed him for a staggering 1,300 marks, something that shocked and scandalized polite society. The next time, they offered their services to men of God. In 1331, the abbot of Sempringham Priory and the cellarer of Haverholm Abbey, who previously sheltered the Fallvilles from the law, paid them 20 pounds to destroy a water mill owned by a mutual rival. Sure enough, they reduced the mill to a smoking ruin and restored the abbot's monopoly on grinding grain in the region. In 1340, a furious justice of the peace put together a gang of armed men and invaded the church of the village of Tea, where Richard Falville served as priest. The mob murdered the priest, dragged him into the churchyard, and chopped his head off in the name of law and order. Richard Falville became the only member of the gang to face justice for his crimes. 
During those years, Queen Isabella's son Edward removed her from power and went to war with France, which seems to have been the main hobby of the kings of England back then. Fortunately for them, King Edward III did not have the means to confront the gangsters, but he could put them to work in up for the English army for a second time and fought for Edward III against the Scots in 1337 and 1338. In exchange, they received a full pardon again, and they never served any punishment for their many crimes. In 1346, serving as a counselor at Crowland Abbey, having never stood trial for any of the charges lodged against him. And instead of remembering Eustace Falville as a reformed outlaw, his mourners celebrated him as a wild and daring man. During the next generation, storytellers completely rewrote the bloody outlaws into folk heroes who took to the road righting wrongs. William Langland's 1377 poem Piers Plowman talks of Falville's laws, or becoming an outlaw, to stop evil men who are protected by the law. How did bloody outlaws get whitewashed into folk heroes? Because the Falville's victims tended to be corrupt and unpopular men themselves. Belair used his office to seize land and siphon money to his flunkies and himself. Willoughby, who later became Chief Justice of the King's Bench, became infamous for selling the laws like herders sold cattle. And in a final twist of irony, Pope Clement VI ordered the men who murdered Richard Falville to undergo penance for murdering a priest. This involved being whipped at each of the churches, and they faced more punishment than the Falvilles ever did. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.